Hello there, Luca and uh, Richard. Hi, Steve. Uh, Hi, Steve. Now, you're both in Europe, and of course, Europe is going through an economic crisis, so they can't afford uh, much lighting over there, so you're both in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Kind of, yeah. um, we've got the wood burner over in the corner of the room, oh. but um, the light's not uh, strong enough to reach me, unfortunately. Good. Anyway, you got better food than we have. Listen, you were recently in Moscow, where I saw both of your presentation. I have to say that both of you have a very relaxed, engaging delivery style, quite different from when we only see the sort of close-up of your head on, uh, you know, on the YouTube videos. So, so I, was quite, I thought it was, it was very well done. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I would like to hear a little bit about your experience in Moscow, uh, what you are expecting in Budapest, and this phenomenon of, of I call it, uh, language-related travel or polyglot tourism. Okay, Richard, you want to go first? I look, you know. Well, don't be bashful now. One of you, Luca, you're on my left. <laughs> okay, uh, well, I have to say that the experience in Moscow was uh, exhilarating, it was really great. Uh, I didn't expect all that, to tell you the truth, because it was the real first uh, language conference that I attended, and I have to say that um, it was very interesting, in very well organized and very interesting, and everybody was uh, sharing their ideas, and they let us speak about, about whatever we wanted to talk about, and uh, it was great, <laughs> in general. Yeah, it was... Yeah, it was. I mean, it was. Um, it was really good. I mean, we. I think we, we both went to, um, to to sort of an academic type conference in Italy, and this was a real sort of conference that was more sort of the style that we look at in, on YouTube, giving um, practical advice, practical help. I mean, both Luca and I did the presentation as you did, Steve, and then we did a masterclass the following day. And um, during the masterclass, we gave sort of tips, advice, things for people to really chew on, to think about uh, in terms of language learning. And um, and that was in front of, of people who, who wanted to come to just specifically listen to what we had to say. I, I think that Richard has a point there because what I wanted to add is that a lot of conferences, especially the one we had in Parma, there were a lot of interesting speakers, obviously, but they were talking about academic stuff that a lot of people actually don't understand. Now, there's a value in academia, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but I do believe that a lot of people are interested in practical ways to learn languages. So that's what happened in, in Russia, and then that's not what happened in, uh, in Parma. It was still a very interesting conference, but when we spoke, we spoke about practical things, and people were even a little bit surprised. Even teachers were in the audience. They were, like, taken aback by the fact that we're talking so practically about languages, it was, uh, I, I believe that when you have to speak about languages, if you have an audience and they're interested in language learning, and that is a practical thing, I believe. So instead of talking about, you know, phonetics and stuff, we just got to the point. And that's what happened in Russia, and that is what is happening in, what is going to happen in Budapest, hopefully. Well, we have yeah. a question. Uh, you know, I also have attended some language conferences. Uh, I attended the uh, so Associate American Council for Teachers of Foreign Languages, ACFTL or something, conference in San Diego. And I attended a thing called the Sprachen und Beruf in, uh, I believe it was Düsseldorf or somewhere. Uh, and yeah, there's a lot more academic presentation and there seems to be sort of the flavor of the, of the month, you know, that everyone will talk about... Uh, uh, you know, English is now an international language, you needn't learn it from a native speaker anymore, which to me always strikes me as nonsense. But, yeah. no, no, I well, say I wouldn't nonsense, go but it, it strikes so me as overstated. Let's put it this way the majority mm -hmm. of English teachers are not native speakers. However, most people learning a language are more inspired to hear and to model themselves on a native speaker, even though they may get advice from. You know, when, when we thought about the conference in Budapest, the very first thing that occurred to us is that we want to make it practical. Now, uh, I uh, want to uh, highlight this point one more time. It's not that I want to bash academia. I think there's a value. I am reading a lot of uh, interesting books about phonetics for my work, for example, and I do believe that they're very interesting, but I also do believe that 
um, you know, this is kind of an alternative. It's the very first time that polyglots talk about language learning in different fields, like raising a multilingual kid or uh, how to become an interpreter, how to use languages for work, etc. So I believe there's a value in it, and that's the very first reason why we decided to do this conference. Okay, so let me hone in there. I'll ask Richard. So is this conference in Budapest aimed at people who already have several languages, who intend to become interpreters, who are already in that sort of advanced level? Or is no, it also aimed not, at no, the no, guy who has never been able to learn another language? No, so I mean, um, as like I said, it's sort of people who have been through the process many times, who are some of the speakers at, at the event. And now Budapest is, is all about bringing together all of the different spheres uh, that you can go into with languages. So offering uh, advice on learning, uh, giving practical uh, help and advice to, to people who want to learn a language, whether it's the first, whether it's the 21st. And uh, by the same, at the same time, what we want to do is take some of these elements of academia that are interesting to people and that people want to know about so that maybe they can pursue uh, their own studies later on taking that and taking, you mentioned two conferences, you went to the academia and the, 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 the work conference, to take also professions like Luca mentioned, uh, interpreting as one, but there are other professions as well that people can get into using languages, mm -hmm. and to, to introduce them in a more neutral setting. Right. So it's not going to be this headhunting, we're after you, um, it's not, as, neither is it going to be this, this is sort of academia, it's all very theoretical, it's going to be an overview of everything so that you can sort of capture all of the relevant and interesting topics surrounding languages under one umbrella and make it accessible for anybody out there to be able to, to, to get links and find out more information to put them in touch with the right people. That's the whole idea and the whole concept of the Polyglot Conferences. So it, it ranges from the person who is still struggling to learn his first language or her first language right through the, to the proficient speaker of three or four or five languages who's looking for yeah. professional opportunities and advice on how to, how to make those languages, uh, you know, not pay for them, but in other words, <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. opportunities based on those languages. I have a question. Oh, sorry, you go ahead. I was just going to say that um, the, the, the name Polyglot Conference is really something that attracts these polyglots to come together to do what we very rarely get to do, and that's to speak lots and lots of languages in person right. and interact with each other right. in one place. Right. And that's something that hasn't really been done before in right. this way. Uh, so this is why it has the title, Polyglot Conferences, mm -hmm. why it's unique, mm -hmm. um, and why it has a sort of a draw for people with multiple languages to come and, and attend. But um, it has ramifications in sort of for, for the whole language community, really something that will pull everyone in. Okay, I, I think we will probably agree that uh, anyone can become a polyglot. Do we agree on that? 100%. Okay, so we don't think that polyglots are, it wasn't that they fell out of the crib and landed on the, you know, corner of their head and that jangled some neurons. <laughs> You know, it's just like anybody, you know, and it's it's like if you do one, you can do two, and if you can do two, you can do three, and so forth and so on. The question I have is, obviously, you know, and this came up on a forum at Link. You know the perfect chapter? There's a, an Englishman who lives in Prague who occasionally does videos, whose name escapes me right now. makes me mad. I'm getting older. I forget names. Anthony Lauder. Anthony Lauder. And he, and so the subject, somebody posted, you know, how do you learn languages, and Luca does it this way, and Richard does it this way, and so forth and so on. And Anthony came in and said, the important thing is, is not how you learn, the important thing is that someone who has done it many times has that experience. So, so my question is, how do you transfer that experience, that confidence, that a multi-language speaker like you guys, uh, that you approach the next language, with all that confidence, a methodology that may vary depending on the person, but the common factor is the confidence. How do you transfer it? Well, uh, the very first thing that I uh, that I do is uh, that I tell every single student that I have and, and I tell everybody is you have to learn how to learn. 
that is a lot of people think um, you know uh, is there a one best method etc cetera, etc cetera. and the thing is that as I said and I highlighted in the, in the conference in Moscow there's no one best method you have to figure out what suits you best um, a lot of people actually have no idea how to learn a language from scratch and what I uh, try to do what I try to do in Moscow for example especially in the master class more than the, in the speech in the, the first day is to tell them look uh, it's a trial and error process it's not a science it's not <laughs> rocket science you know you have to figure out what to do it's very practical um, so I the very first thing that I do is to work on their psychology a psychological factor they a lot of people think that they can't learn a second language uh, for me it's evident that you can do it but for most <laughs> for a lot of people it's not evident at all like they try to say oh it's impossible you know I will never how, how do you do that like if I were an, an extraterrestrial or something and I say uh, I am not it, one other misunderstanding is that when people see us speak 20 languages 15 12 they think we're like some sort of genius born with a, a rare breed and that's absolutely not true. If you see people in Congo and Luxembourg, they speak four or five languages because there's a lifestyle. They do it because they use it. So what I do, for example, uh, when people ask me, how do you keep so many languages in your mind? How do you keep them active? It's simply because they chose a job. And when, when it comes to speaking a lot of languages, you have to make choices in life, like everything. Uh, what I did, for example, is I decided to work with uh, languages. I hold a degree in electronic engineering, and then I told myself, of course, I could use languages at work. But if I... If I use them, uh, if I work with languages, I could, uh, you know, use languages every single day. So a lifestyle and mentality is very important. So that's even more important than the method itself. You know, people focus and talk so much about that's the best method. No, my method is better. And yet, I think it's the they are missing the point. If we see uh, the best way to um, understand this is that I am with Steve, Richard, Luca, and it's the three of us. We all have different approaches, but we have a lot of things in common. So when a person is trying to get the best out of everybody, I think they should look at the com at the things that are common in the uh, you know in, in us. And I think we have a lot of things in common, even if obviously we disagree on some aspects of language learning, whatever. But that's normal. That's that's the very first thing that I tell everybody. You know, you first have to understand how to learn a language and have a positive mentality because learning language is not as difficult as a lot of people think. I see it clearly now that I speak ten languages, and I think you have the same vision, where I believe, I assume. How do you how do you talk Luca Lampariello? <laughs> I mean, I can I can really only echo what he said, and um, you know, to me, all of that's true. Motivation is really important, and um, I, I like to see the person as a whole. So whether it's a, a young child or an adult language learner, you you have to take the whole person and not just the language, because people people don't sort of live their lives in vacuums. So language learning can't act in a vacuum either. You can't just do it and say, okay, you're learning a language, then that's it. You need to you need to see what their lives are like, and it's, it's all very individual. So, um, you know, how someone thinks, how someone learns, it's all really key to hone in on, on what works best for their environment, their personality, their particular situation, their mood even, and, and give them tools to be able to motivate themselves to carry on with the learning. Okay, but in many that's not very helpful to someone who doesn't have the experience, uh, who's looking for some kind of a hint, you know. Uh, the magic pill, you mean, Steve? Well, what are the things that are in common? Because every person is not going to have a private tutor that can tailor the program to their needs. So there have to be, and I think I think we all feel that it's it's nice that there are people who speak five, six, seven languages and go to polyglot conferences. But if I look here in, in North America, you know, very few people speak more than one language. Um, one we, of my we, motivations actively, we actively promote Ling as, an, as one way of learning. <laughs> I beg your pardon? We actively promote Ling as one well, way of learning. That's very good. But, but really, it, it needn't be Ling. Like, there are some of the common elements are what? Like, first of all, obviously, motivation. If you're not motivated, you're not going to learn. Uh, exactly. 
you know, be positive. Don't allow yourself to be frustrated. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time. I always say do things, and I noticed that Luca said the same thing. Do things that you enjoy doing. Don't, don't push yourself at some method of learning which you don't enjoy. And so those are some of the things that are in common. Where we disagree is some people like to speak uh, right away, some people like to spend a fair amount of time on input before they start speaking. This is going to depend on people's personality to some extent. But if you were to say, Luca, say, if you were to say, okay, here are three things that are in common, that all successful language learners have in common, what would those be? Well, uh, I first, passion and motivation. I would say. Second, I would say that we all have, you know, when we start learning a language, maybe I'm just talking about myself, but I set clear goals immediately. A lot of people have unclear goals. Like they just want to learn a language for the sake of it. But if you make it clear that you're learning a language for some reason, maybe because you want to want to find a wife, <laughs> because you want to live in the country, etc. I believe that in my case, for example, um, when it comes to when I started learning uh, Polish, it was some some months ago. I was I visited Richard in Poland, and it was immediately clear to me that I wanted to learn Polish for a reason. That is to use to use Polish to maybe live in Poland. And the same thing goes for Japanese. A lot of people ask me, for example, I want to, uh, or tell me, send me messages and say, I want to learn Japanese. And I ask them, why? Because. <laughs> There's no reason. If you don't have a clear objective, um, I think you're going to lose track and you're going to, you know, you're not going to follow the path to the end. This is one other thing. For example, when you start learning languages, you want to, I want to use them. Um, there are a lot of people who dabble in languages, like speaking a little bit, have a smattering of the language. But as far as I'm concerned, every single language that I learn, once I set, I say, I tell myself, day X, that's the beginning of the adventure and I want to bring it to a level where I can use it. So the fact of having clear objectives for me is extremely important. Um, so apart from motivate, and that motivates me, that's a, that's a virtuous circle. Every time I learn something, 30 minutes, I imagine myself speaking the language, going to the country and so on. That, that, is ex that, that's, that fuels my language study. Um, and well, motivation, obviously, and then, uh, you know, this uh, having clear goals, be determined, learn every, maybe you don't learn every day, you too, but I do try to learn every single day. Uh, no, I, you know. I try to get it if, if I miss a day or two, but, but the, the goal is to try and be on it every day for sure. That's, uh, you know, when you see, uh, for example, I, I was uh, back in from, from Russia a couple week ago and I saw that my, uh, my, I hadn't touched Polish. I maybe I spoke with, in Polish with Richard in the car, but it was a very brief conversation. And I saw that it's like feeding your brain. It's r literally feeding your brain. So if you st try to do, a lot of people think, oh, I, don't, I don't have the time. It's not that we don't have the time. It's that we don't make the time because, as I, as I said, with your MP3, if you have developed good strategies and you put something in your MP3, uh, you go to the supermarket, washing the dishes, etc., you can try, you can feed your brain constantly. Uh, okay. So you have no excuse. Right. Well, let, let's hear Richard, and then I'm going to make some comments on, on the points that you made. Richard. Okay. So um, would my, three would, my three would be, um, so motivation and reason, like Luca said. Right. Uh, right. Regular study and... Um, the other thing that I'd say that's key is finding content that stimulates you and it's accessible to you and it's easy for you to use. They're the three key things I think I, agree. I can, I I can give. Okay, <laughs> we can put those in the bank. <laughs> yeah. I agree. <laughs> those three, they're gone. Okay. Now, there are problems though. Uh, to okay. be fair, we are confident. We know that we're good at learning languages. That's part of the motivation. Because, you know, it's, we, we know, you know, it's like if you've never climbed a mountain, you might be reluctant to climb a mountain. But once you've done it once, you say, hey, that was fun. I can climb another mountain and another mountain. But someone who's never done it doesn't have that confidence. So, so that's something that we have to recognize. Uh, also, I agree with, with Luca, and I think Richard's the same way. If I'm going to start learning a language, I want to get to the point where I can have intelligent adult conversations with people. I mean, that's the goal. I don't, don't want to just order a beer in the language. Uh, the other thing I think that's important to remember is if you put in the time, if you do it every day or almost every day, that, that all the time you're putting in, you are improving. 
So even if you're not aware of the fact that you're improving, you're feeding your brain and you are improving. And I think people sometimes get frustrated because they don't have the sense that they're improving. And they have to believe that if they put in the time, they're going to get better. Absolutely. One thing I just want to follow up on with what you said there, Steve, which is interesting. You said that you want to get to this level where you speak it really quite fluently, and Luca has the same feeling. This is where I might diverge slightly from you guys, in that um, I, like a lot of other people, will see a reason to be at a certain level in different languages. So let's say, for example, one of my friends wants to go to Spain. I've got a very good friend. In fact, she's my best friend. And um, she wanted to go to Spain on holiday. She picked up a book and she started going through it enough to be able to go to Spain, order her meals, get around, do what she needs to do, get to kind of an A1, maybe towards an A2 level. And then that was it. It was plenty. And she, she achieved her goal. So she had a motivation, holiday, she had a, her courses that she liked, she found them, she learned it to the level she needed it for the holiday, and she did it successfully. And she had a satisfaction from that as well, she came back and spoke very positively about it. Where I think the language community sometimes, especially um, where we're talking about people like us who are serial language learners or sort of uh, extreme language learners, however you want to phrase it. We tend to sort of look upwards to this different different plane of learning, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but I think there's a lot, of, uh, a lot to be said for achieving a, a nice basic level or an intermediate level, if that's all you need. There's no need for everyone to chase this sort of very difficult to define fluency or, um, or sort of reading some sort of obscure book or... Or if that's your goal, great, go for it. But I think if, if you don't need it for anything more, hey, if you're just selling uh, fans on the street like uh, a kid on YouTube in India, all you need is the words to be able to uh, negotiate price and tell them what you're selling, and that's about it. And you're a successful language learner for what you need it for. And uh, I've got languages uh, myself at the, to the same level. Luca will Luca testify. Will My Russian is, is a level is where I can understand it pretty well. My spoken My Russian, Russian, probably an A2 ish. <laughs> Maybe going a little bit higher than O, but um, that's about it. But it's sufficient for me to do what I want, to communicate, to get around in Russia. And I did it fine the whole time there. I had me conversations. With, with, with terrible grammar, but it doesn't matter. That's all I need it for. Okay, but I, where I would, uh, I don't want to disagree, but I think you said that you understand Russian well. My impression listening to you speak is that you speak it well. But uh, the, the goal is comprehension. I had the situation when I started learning Portuguese, I went to Portugal, and I had gone through, this is before we had it at Link, I'd gone through living language and teach yourself or whatever. I couldn't understand what they were saying. I could say what I wanted to say, and then they came back at me, and I didn't know what they were saying. And so I, I think comprehension, like, and now I'm going to Romania six weeks from now. I'm going to spend three days there. So I'm going to go at Romanian like a, a mad bandit, but I have no illusions. And I, I, you know, I have no illusions, but I'm going to rent a car and drive around the country for a couple of days. I want to at least understand something. And I doubt that I will then continue and take it to that other level. The level that I'm talking about is not reading obscure books. It's not speaking flawlessly. It's understanding the radio, understanding, you know, the newspapers and being able to speak with mistakes. I mean, I speak Russian with mistakes as well. I mean, uh, there's no way Me too. Be <laughs> Me too. <laughs> There's no way you can be flawless in ten languages, and I have no illusions about being flawless in ten languages. But I, it, it's the comprehension part that's important to me. Well, I think that we're you're you are interacting with, uh, for example, when I was interacting with Russians or when I interact with foreigners. I think that the very first thing you're comfortable in a conversation when you can understand the other person. 100%. A lot of people focus on focus on, for example, fluency, they say oh, they constantly talk about speaking the language, but uh, it so much happens that sometimes we can speak the language, but we, if we don't understand, it's communication is always bi bidirectional, you always interact with another person, um, and that's the reason why I believe that understanding is extremely important first, and um, I think this is also 
uh, another point, a lot of people ask me, for example, that's maybe that's a trivial question. Why can I read text and I don't understand the radio? And I tell them, well, you know, there's a few reasons for that. Um, and they are, a lot of people don't know how to build this comprehension thing. And, and I tell them, you know, what you have to do is you have to listen. Um, but... Um, I also believe that now in the internet era we have the possibility of reading what we are listening to and that makes a huge difference because I always tell them look uh, when we talk about when you hear the language the reason why you don't understand it is simply because a language is a, it is like a waveform and you don't have boundaries uh, among words there are no boundaries in real speech in connected speech but we see the, the, the boundaries because we have this mental lexicon. We see words because we know written words. But the problem is that when you start, I, my first, um, my advice, I think it's sound advice, is to read and listen at the same time. You always make sure that you understand what you're dealing with. The reason why a lot of people give up, for example, is that they don't know how to choose uh, interesting content and un un intelligible content. That is, they don't understand what they're doing. And if you listen to the radio and you don't understand it, you're going to listen maybe for five minutes and then you're going to quit. You're going to say, I don't understand this. It's not for me. I will never understand it. And understanding, like speaking, is an ability that you build up with time, but you have to know how to do it. And since we have no more excuses because we can read and listen, for example, Echo, Echo Moskve is just one site. It's an incredible site. Incredible. You, everything is written. You can see whatever you want, like Dimitri uh, Petrov. Jeski Roslas, Jeski Roslas for Czech. Unbelievable. And, and, there, and, and even in, um, you know, for example, there's uh, ARD in, in German. You can watch a lot of movies, documentaries, all subtitles. You can do whatever you want. So there's, you just have to know where to look for it. If you know, uh, let's suppose you want to learn German, or let's suppose you want to learn uh, Russian. Obviously, if you try to understand everything in Echo Moskva and you're just a beginner, you're going to fail because it's a pretty complicated text. But once you get a, a smattering of the language, you can start uh, you know, listening to it and look at for words, etc., etc. And I do believe that this ability that we have to use as adults, differently from kids at the beginning, we can actually use everything, mouth, uh, ears, eyes, etc., etc. So why don't we take advantage of that? You know, that's, that's one of the most important things ever. People say, oh, you're doing multitasking. Yeah, I'm doing multitasking. I'm listening and reading at the same time. Especially because um, another thing which I consider interesting, I don't know about you, about you guys, but I constantly see subtitles in my, with my third eye. And the reason why, and I said that in a YouTube video, and the reason why this, uh, you know, I see subtitles is that be, uh, because I read and listen constantly. Um, I always watch movies, for example, with subtitles, documentaries, etc., etc., and this creates a bond between the written words and uh, sounds. Maybe I work, my brain works uh, differently, but I believe that our brain works more or less in the same way. So when people say, oh, he's a genius because his work, uh, obviously there are differences. You know, there are um, people who are more gifted for some things, but we all learn the same way. I always say my, the point is if you speak your native tongue, you can speak any other language in the world if you want to. That's my point. Richard, any Richard. comments on that? What can I say? What can I say to follow the <laughs> Pino? <laughs> I, I, I'm, lost for, I'm lost for words. Let the me Pino. ask you a question then. I was in Mexico with the Mexican polyglots, very enthusiastic oh. bunch. Wherever I've traveled, there is this tremendous enthusiasm. How are you going to mobilize this enthusiasm? What are your plans with these different conferences or other activities? How are you going to mobilize the enthusiasm, first of all, amongst the polyglot community, wherever they're located, Japan, China, Mexico, you name it. And B, how do you allow this to trickle down to your average person in London or in Rome who only speaks his or her native language? Wow. First of all, thank you for, uh, for giving me such a, a, a raise in, in ability to do such a thing. I think it's the community. Um, it's the community that needs to do this. It's individuals that need to do this. So I don't see myself as, as this 
sort of big authority that would, would, would do this all myself. There's no way one individual can do this all themselves. There's no way. My contribution to the process is um, together with Luca and with other people who are prominent in the community and who are really active and enthusiastic to share that enthusiasm, to share that motivation in settings that other people can access. Anyone's free to um, try and get to one of the conferences that we will now have annually and they can come and interact and get motivated that way. Same way as this sort of Esperanto conferences work, I guess, the Esperanto community. So from that, what I'd like to see are more groups of people getting together locally as well, feeding into um, th things like the LEI, the Language Exchange International, and getting recognition with them, getting more um, more of what they do out there to the wider audience. And that's how you affect the local level of how people uh, learn languages or support the language learning process. We saw one really good example of this, for example, in, um, in Poznan, where there's a language group for Spanish. They meet every week, and they're Polish people that want to speak Spanish or want to learn Spanish. And it's... Um, it's organized by a school in the very center of, of Poznan, uh, the Buenos Aires School uh, for, uh, for Spanish. And I'm going to go and talk in um, Budapest actually in just under two weeks uh, at the Budapest Melting Pot, which has a group of people in Budapest who get together to practice their English. And I'll go and give talks and talk to people in an informal way and they can come and listen to it and ask me questions, interact. And, um, I think that's the way you do it. You, you, you need to get people engaged on the local level, but also have other events that they can either go to or look to go to and get people motivated to do it themselves. Okay, well, I guess we've, we've covered a lot of ground. One final question. Uh, do you think that for the average person who has trouble learning one other language, being confronted by a polyglot who speaks 10 or 15 or 20, is that motivating or intimidating? Well, um, a lot of people tend to compare themselves with others. And that's, um, I think, a very... Um, it's a blunder, it's a mistake, because we, I think they have to compare it to themselves. If you compare yourself to Tiger Woods, uh, do you want to play golf? Then, well, you better not start playing golf. You better do something else. Um, I believe that everybody is different. And if we, if that person compares with me, they're comparing apples with oranges for the simple fact that I, I have, I find myself in different conditions. I have a different life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So even when people compare polyglots, they're comparing uh, apples with oranges. I believe that the very first thing you have to do is uh, yourself, look, it's it's about personal growth. When you're learning a language, you do it for yourself. You don't do it for the other. So you have to look at those people who made it, who learn a lot of languages and tell themselves they're not, they're, they don't have to be role models. They just have to be people who can inspire you, take the inspiration, and then you just uh, start working uh, on yourself. That's, <clears throat> I, I think this thing of comparing, it creates envy, creates a lot of problems and a negative energy that actually hampers uh, people from learning languages. People are constantly worried about being judged on YouTube. Um, for example, there's a lot of people I know personally who are ex exceptional. They're, they're very good with languages and they never wanted to start a YouTube channel because they fear that they're going to be slaughtered by other people. So I think that 90 percent by the odd one. On a on a on a positive on a positive note, I have to say that the community is uh, very friendly. For ninety percent of, there are some weird individuals out there, but <laughs> for <clears throat> for the most part, I think that they we all uh, you know support each other, and that's the very uh, and I think that um, when we thought about this conference. It, we are not, we, the polyglots, if you want to call this this way, we're not there to educate the audience. We are there to interact and share. That's very different. Um, I have a few friends coming who are linguists or like people who speak a lot of languages and they want to interact. They're not there to be, you know, educated by the experts. Uh, and that's a very important point. Okay. Okay. Richard? Richard? Uh, um, well, I Do we motivate or intimidate? 
I can speak from experience of what I've I've heard back and from feedback. Of course, like Lucas says, there are going to be people who will have negative feelings, maybe from their own personal situation that they, they didn't feel adequate. Um, I I really try to discourage people from feeling that way. I think that it's it's not helpful, and everybody's got their own things that they're good at, and languages is always an it can always be an add-on. So, what Lucre you, Steve, and, and I have done is is learn a number of languages, which, let's face it, for most job requirements, is completely unnecessary. It's completely unnecessary. In practical terms, you do not need to speak for, for work, or most times as well, nine times out of ten for your life, you don't need to speak more than, say, five, six, seven languages maximum. I mean... Even if you're living in the center of, of Luxembourg and you've got your five languages and maybe you want to translate Dutch so you pick the next one, you don't need any more than, than that ever. So once you've got over this sort of six languages, I think you're getting into the realms of, okay, but this six is... Six languages is already up there in the stratosphere for most people. It, it most is. Most struggle and, with one, one new language. Yeah. What, what, I, what my point is is that comparing to us, is completely pointless because it, it's it, it, there's no actual real use for it in terms of what you can do extra than you can do with an extra few languages. That's the first point I'd like to make. So someone comparing themselves to me or to Luke or to you is, for me, totally incomprehensible. Um, it's an extreme. It's like extreme sports. And um, we don't get anything particularly from doing that per se. It might be a nice benefit for a company if you work for them to have the extra language, but it's never a prerequisite. The next thing I'd like to say is that um, if people feel um, demotivated, then it's normally because of that reason, that they feel this negativity because of the, the level at which we're l learning languages, the amount of languages. And that's normally where the negativity comes in, in my experience. But on the whole... Many people I meet say, after speaking to you, I really want to learn a language now. And I've had that said to me countless times, Steve, uh, not just via Facebook, not just via YouTube, but in person. And people have actually picked up books and started learning. And I've seen people become fluent uh, through that period of time. One of my very good friends in, in, in Skopje, he, he always said, oh, I'm terrible at languages and terrible at languages. And he through me, has found uh, materials that he can use that work for him in his busy, sh busy schedule. He, he works um, in a different place. He has to travel a lot. And I've, I've introduced him to ways in which he can learn languages and access materials. And now, because of that, he's been doing it regularly for over a year. And he's really making progress in his, in his studies. So, no, I, do, I don't think it's, it's, it has to be a negative thing. I think it... It's, it should be a positive thing, but I think the mindset of the individual needs to be there, and I think that the determination and motivation is probably what's lacking not as more than uh, the, this sort of who we are and what we do. I think yeah. that's... The, well, I think that's, that's a good note to end on, and I'll just chime in with, with my thoughts. And I go back to what Lucas said at the very beginning, that the presentation that both of you made in Moscow was based on very practical considerations, not theoretical, not academic uh, considerations. And I think, I think that the majority of people who hear about us or watch us on YouTube or talk to us, in fact, are encouraged because we tell people it's a lot of work. It's, you know, there's a lot of time involved. You have to commit. But the process itself is not difficult. It doesn't require the mind of a nuclear physicist to do. I mean, anyone can do it who is willing to do what we've done. And if we speak a lot of languages, it's because we put a lot of work into it. Like, I don't know many people who have put as much work into language learning as I do. So I think, yeah, I think probably most people are encouraged. Uh, and I think most people, as we've said today, can do it if they're willing to, to you know, put the time in. And again, as Lucas said, and I think you mentioned, if you can, and you mentioned just recently, Richard, if you can find the right kind of materials that are interesting, that are comprehensible, then, and that part, partly is the problem. People don't know to, where to go and find these. So, uh, yeah, let's just say then that uh, we'll continue doing what we're doing. Again, if I can get involved and help out, I'm sorry that I'm not involved in, in Budapest, but perhaps the next one in, uh, 
in North America. I can be more involved. And, and, uh, and one other thing, you say we don't get anything out of it, we do. It's tremendously personally rewarding. It has also helped me in my business career in the wood business, my Japanese, my French, and so forth. So it can also be professionally rewarding, but it is always personally and culturally uh, it's, rewarding. I, I, I always say, I like saying that language can change your life. They changed mine, then they changed Richard's life. They can change mine not only for work, for right. ever, everything. everything. Okay, well, we, you know, we could probably talk uh, on this subject for another couple of hours, but I think I'll <laughs> cut it off here. Thank you very much. So I'm going to stop the recording, and we can perhaps summarize a little after, after the fact here. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Steve. Thank, Thank you for now.